Welcome back to part two of our European News 2019 look back on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. We'll kick off in September with the release of dozens of Ukrainians from Russian custody in a prisoner swap. Among those freed was Oleg Sentsov, the Crimean filmmaker held by Russia for five years after a trial widely decried as illegitimate in the West. During that time, he was moved from jail to jail. He went on a hunger strike and his health deteriorated drastically. He was also awarded the European Union's Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought in Absentia at the end of 2018. Almost a year later, I met him as he received his award at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. I asked if he felt that European pressure had helped to get him freed. Yes, of course. Of course it is. And the prize is one of the factors. You must understand there were many factors. Everybody did a little bit. It's like you're putting tiny pebbles on the scales where our destiny was placed. I'm not the only one. 35 people released. Everybody did what they could. I, I know there were huge protests in France. The cinema world and the tent that was set up opposite the Russian embassy in Paris. People went on hunger strikes to support me. So everybody exercised pressure. We're grateful to the European Parliament and to every country, Ukraine and all our closest partners, and it worked. For Putin, we became a thorn in his side, and he decided to get rid of us at some point. Now, of course, there are still many other Ukrainian political prisoners in Russia. The precise number isn't, in fact, known. Uh, do you believe that you, in turn, can be a sort of a, a pebble, like you said? And uh, are you going to continue speaking out to try and get them released? Yes, absolutely right. Oh, about a hundred people are imprisoned in Russia. Mainly they're Crimean Tatars. Over 200 people are held by the separatists controlled by Russia in Donbass. Of course I'll keep talking about it and do everything I can to throw that very little people. You're quite right. In October, European eyes looked to Syria as Donald Trump announced he was withdrawing American troops. In the aftermath, Turkey moved into territory previously held by Syrian Kurds, attacking fighters that had until then been supported from the US-led coalition against the Islamic State group. Now, Europeans were seen as unsure of how to respond, many capitals already reeling from a threat from the Turkish president earlier in the year to, quote, open the floodgates to Europe for Syrian migrants if the EU lessened its support for Turkey. My colleague Luke Brown asked the new European Commissioner who's in charge of migration for his response to that threat from Recep Tayyip Erdogan. I think that we have to uh, put aside uh, the rhetoric and concentrate on the substance. Uh, we do have uh, an EU-Turkey agreement for an orderly management of migratory flows. Um, uh, the problem with this agreement is that it's being applied uh, in a way that I could call irregular. So sometimes you have many people crossing, sometimes you have non-crossing. So we need a more predictable, orderly management as stipulated in the agreement. And of course, we need to continue engaging with Turkey uh, because we should never forget that Turkey already uh, uh, has four million Syrian refugees on their territory, uh, and they have to uh, continue uh, organizing the reception facilities for these people with the help of the European Union. So when a neighbor has a problem, you have to engage with the neighbor. Well, Margarita Skinas also told us he's keen to have a new text for an EU-wide migration agreement in place before a summit in March 2020. One major focus for the European Union next year will be its relations with Africa. That's the continent of origin for thousands of the people who seek to start a new life in Europe each year. One aim is to support development in countries such as Mali. Our reporters Mathilde Benezet and Anaïs Guerra travelled there to see what kind of schemes could be in the pipeline. 14 years ago, Messina Keita faced a tough decision stay in Mali and try to farm his meagre patch of land with few resources or try his luck elsewhere. He chose to leave but is now back and proud to be making his way farming fruit and vegetables. Here I had land but no equipment to grow anything. 
So I went to this city to earn money. I wanted to buy a motorized pump and come back to keep farming. But I never managed to earn enough. So when I heard that I could earn a lot more by panning for gold, I left again. But it was so hard. It was only when I came back that I heard about the Fier project via our village chief. Fier means proud in English. The project distributes financial help via the International Fund for Agricultural Development. The aim, to help young people to forge a viable future in their home regions, with the double advantage of adding value to their lands. Vecina has since doubled the amount of farmland he started with and tripled his profits. I've learned so much from being involved in the FIA project. I've learned how to look after my plants, make my own compost, and now I'm not just supporting myself, but my family too. He's also learned how to maximize his yield and manage investments, key business skills that have seen Lassina grow his farm to three hectares in total, including an orchard, a market garden and a herd of 75 cows. A success that can help inspire others. This project isn't about telling anyone how to run their business. The young person is in charge. Like with Elisina, he's a role model for young people to show them they are capable of building their self-esteem and having confidence in their country. Two-thirds of Mali's population is aged under 25 and most live in rural areas. The government sees this as a key source of future economic growth. Developing the farming sector develops Mali's economy and helps make Mali become an emerging market state. We must become capable of feeding ourselves. A country that feeds itself and works for its own development is a country that is creating wealth and jobs. For me, that's what sovereignty means. And every young person that has sovereignty and self-respect has no need to go anywhere else. But what about other young Malians who don't have their own land? Lassina has taken on two other young returnees, his brother Yakuba and best friend Sumaila. Now they're both working towards getting their own funding from the FIER project to set up on their own. You leave your own country in the hope of finding a better future elsewhere. When life isn't working out at home, you have no choice but to leave. I went to Libya and stayed there for seven years. Lots of people died on the way through the Sahara. The war started while I was there. They took everything I had and deported me. When I came home, I had nothing at all. So I started growing fruit and veg with Lassina. He's taught me a lot, and I'd like to go on to do even better than him. My ambition now is to make my life here. I never want to leave again. Since it was launched in 2014, the FIER project has already funded over 4,000 young Malians. But the organisers aren't stopping there. Their aim is to reach 15,000. Now, did you know that agriculture is one of the big battlegrounds as the EU's member states spent 2019 continuing to wrangle over the next seven years of the European budget? The biggest single portion of the budget goes on agriculture. And what's more, the most popular programme run by the EU is Erasmus. Proponents of both are calling for more funding. Luke Brown went to meet some of the farming students who are hoping that there will be a double financial boost for them. Getting stuck into life on an Estonian farm. Tiffen and Alain are from Brittany. They're students at a high school specialising in agriculture here on an Erasmus exchange. Alain is showing off what he's learned. I knew that there had been a few births, but I didn't think I would see one all the way through. Even though it's all sticky, it's cute. It's the miracle of life. In France or in Estonia, carving is a physical job. But the experience is all about learning new ways of working. Two more students, Alexi and Kilian, are also hard at work. Each pupil received 780 euros from the Erasmus Fund. That pays for travel, lodging and food. Here the boys get more first-hand experience of local farm equipment. More than one in five of the 85,000 French Erasmus students last year come from vocational training courses like this. They all use the common agricultural policy, so it's important that they realize that in Estonia or in another country, they do things that work with the same goal in mind. In all, 10 million youngsters have participated over the past three decades in the Erasmus programme. 
The current EU-wide budget for Erasmus is 2.2 billion euros a year, but that's set to increase sharply. We want to triple the budget. We're already sure that it will double, and that would mean 30 billion euros for the period 2021 to 2027 to finance more people to travel. The atmosphere is decidedly studious for these Erasmus students. Camelia and Bianca are from Romania. Erasmus isn't just about their personal ambitions, but also about contributing to farming back home in Romania. This experience will help Romanian farming a great deal, because I will return home. I have my dreams. I want to do great things for farming. Erasmus has been helping the cross-pollination of ideas across Europe since 1989. Candidates for this year's programme have until February to apply. In November, a celebration of the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, as the German capital filled up with visitors, we spoke to a former advisor to the first Chancellor of the reunified Germany, Helmut Kohl. Joachim Bitterlich was closely involved in the reunification process, a process he told my colleague Armin Georgian is still ongoing. Please bear in mind, people had been living during 40 years in a communist system, what we call a dictatorship mm. to a certain extent. Mm. And in order to get really Germany reunified mm. entirely, you need at least two generations again. Mm. And we have now 30 years behind us. We have reached many things. It's not perfect at all. Mm. We had to discover really in the early 90s the, G the reality of a GDR. We were going from one surprise to the next. We pumped many money in this area, yes, but money does not replace what I call the soul. November's 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall was a time for reflection for Berliners, Germans and the rest of us. Our correspondent Nick Spicer met up with one French artist who risked his life in the 1980s to paint the Berlin Wall with his striking designs. He and visitors from around the world told Nick what the wall means to them today. Thierry Noir's painted pieces of the Berlin Wall grace museums around the world. As a poor artist in Cold War West Berlin, he risked his life for art. That, that, that area was a, the death strip. Noir shows a photo of the wall taken from his bathroom. Once, armed East German border guards climbed over to stop his work. Those guys like me, at that time, we are, they are called the border artists to, uh, to give a signal to the population of their countries there's something wrong in our country. And something was very wrong for the families in the divided Germany. I'm standing right on the path of the former Berlin Wall. That was east, and that was west. I would have been sitting atop it 30 years ago, a target for East German snipers. Over 300 people died trying to get through the wall, and tens of thousands more were imprisoned in East Germany for trying to do so. Noir wants to remind us of that at the East Side Gallery. A stretch of the wall, scores of artists painted to preserve its remains. And its message, as for this Mexican family. I have a lot of feelings now seeing this. And when the United States talks about to make a wall, it's amazing how we can separate people. We were talking about how the people from one night to another become separated. But other tourists find optimism. I hope uh, South Korea and North Korea, we could reconciliate soon, like Berlin. History is impossible to predict, though a passerby in the 80s once surprised Noir as he painted. Uh, some other guys were telling us that hey, one day your, your painting will end on the museum. And he was right. The wall is gone. The art remains. Back to Brexit in December as the process took a decisive turn. Boris Johnson and his Conservative Party winning a snap election in the United Kingdom with a comfortable majority. The British Prime Minister promised to pass his Brexit deal as soon as possible. The day after the election, I sat down with the EU's new High Representative for External Affairs. I asked Joseph Burrell if he thought the UK and the EU could reach a final agreement on their future relationship, ready to go by the end of the transition period in 2020. He suggested that some issues might have to be dealt with after that deadline. That's what we have to try. And we you will think engage. it could be done? It has to be done. 
it has to be done. We will engage all our efforts. We already have a, a big guidelines uh, on the agreement of the withdrawal agreement. There is a political declaration who sets a clear guideline for the future status. And, well, maybe something will have to be dealt with after, but the core of the future relations has to be decided in this, in this time. And that brings us pretty much to the end of the year. Whatever 2020 brings, we know that many of the issues we've covered in 2019 will still be with us. We'll be starting off with a biggie, the UK formally exiting the EU and entering that famous transition period. Aside from the political considerations, we're going to leave you with some creative ones. We recently had four multi-million selling British authors in the studio. Historical novelist Ken Follett and Kate Moss, thriller writer Lee Child and author and screenwriter Jojo Moyes. We asked them how the ongoing political turmoil in their home country might feed through into their work. Weirdly, I think, even if we're not aware of it at the time, all these things feed through into our fiction, perhaps in Kate and Ken's case more obviously because mm. you write about grand geopolitical events. People's minds are made up. So non-fiction, it's very, very difficult. And when you put the word Brexit in anything, people know what they think. But with a novel, you see, we're stealthy. We kind of sneak in. And that's the point about reading fiction. All the Reacher books are about Reacher versus the big guy behind the scenes. <laughs> And that is really a, what I think is is interesting about Brexit. I mean, who who is pushing it and why? I mean, what, who is going to benefit? And that's the guy Reacher would be going after. Well, whatever happens, it's sure to be interesting and we will be with you through it all here on France 24. Next week, we've got an end-of-year treat for you on Talking Europe. In part one, we're meeting Brit in Paris and avid European cliché watcher, the comedian Paul Taylor. And in part two, an extended interview with the Northern Macedonian filmmaker who's breaking taboos as the winner of the 2019 EU Cinema Award, the Lux Prize. See you then and bye for now.